this morning comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. Again, you can follow along on the Zoom slides or go to pages 5 and 6 of the New Testament on the Pew Bibles. Jesus said this, Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who's in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you're praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before I jump into today's message, I wanna provide some context of where we've been over the next few weeks and where we're going over the next few months. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about acting upon our faith. What we as a community of believers need to do to act upon what we believe in. You'll remember if you've been here, we had the story of the Good Samaritan, the story of Mary and Martha, and other similar stories that color that theme. Next week, as I said, Shannon Kaiser will be here. She's gonna talk about forgiveness. So a continuation of that theme. When I get back from vacation, the first Sunday of August, I have a, the a, a, a sermon series that I'm calling Sunday School Bible Stories for adults and kids. We'll talk about Jonah, we'll talk about David and Goliath, we'll talk about Jesus and the feeding of the 5,000, and other well-known stories to those of us who grew up in Sunday school. Then, starting after Labor Day, we're going to go about almost two months in the book of Acts. We're going to talk about the early church, from Pentecost to the early meetings of the church, to Paul and Peter and Paul's um, missionary trips, and what all that history says to the church today. And then, because I can't wait till Christmas, uh, starting in, in mid-November, November 13th through Christmas. Christmas Day is actually a Sunday this year. Uh, we're going to talk about Advent and the stories around the coming of Christ. So that's where we're going to be between now and the end of the calendar year. Today, as was obvious by the Matthew reading I just shared, we're going to talk about prayer. Now, this Matthew passage comes, as I said, from Matthew chapter 6. So it's part of that uh, uh, Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. So before I jump right in again, I'm sort of into context today, let's talk about context. Matthew chapter 1 opens with a lineage of Jesus demonstrating lineage, Jesus' ancestors all the way back to Father Abraham. As Matthew was written to a Jewish audience, this would have been important to them to see the connective tissue that attaches Jesus to all the great prophets who came before, again, all the way back to and including Father Abraham. There's also Matthew chapter one, there's a little tiny story about the birth of Christ, not the familiar one from Luke chapter two that we generally use. Matthew 2, then, we have the story of the Magi, of the wise men who come, and then the vision that comes to Joseph and Mary that tell them to flee with their newborn son to Egypt. For what comes next 
is Herod and the massacre of the infants. Mary and Joseph then return from Egypt. And Matthew 3 talks about John the Baptist and the baptism of Christ. Matthew 4 is the fairly well-known passage, the temptations of Jesus in the desert and Jesus' initial calling of the disciples. And that leads us right up to Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, the beginning of the Sermon of the Mount, which starts with these words. Jesus saw the crowds. He went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to speak, and he taught them. I would encourage you to go home this afternoon, if you have a moment, and read Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. It'll just take a moment, but it'll provide some overall context of Jesus' teaching. And again, if you grew up going to Sunday school like I did, these passages are familiar. There's the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, and on and on. You are the salt of the world. You are the light of the world. The passage in teaching on the lilies of the field. This is where the golden rule comes from. Then there's also a section on spiritual practices. The giving of alms, fasting, and prayer, which leads us to where we are today. So my point is, this is very early teaching. This is Jesus' according to Matthew, Jesus' first teaching to people who came to hear what he had to say. And one of his great focuses was prayer. Whenever you pray, he said, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen. Whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who was in secret. And the Lord who sees in secret will reward you. Jesus is making the point that prayer is both sacred and individualized. I think of it like dieting, although clearly I am the worst person in the world to give advice on dieting. But you have to do what works for you and what you can embrace as a lifestyle and not just a once in a while thing. This passage is not saying pray alone and only pray alone. It's saying, don't make prayer a performance. The hypocrites that Jesus talk about are praying, quote, so that they may be seen, unquote. That's what Jesus is speaking out against. Clearly, there's value in praying alone, but there's also value in praying together as community, as we've done already this morning. Passage goes on to say, when you're praying, don't heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think they're going to be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask. Again, this is it's not a performance. We believe in an almighty and omniscient God. Revelation 1 says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega says the Lord, who is and was and is to come. I am the Almighty. Newsflash, when we pray, we're not telling God about stuff he doesn't know. This isn't like the evening news. Sure, we're giving thanks to the Lord. Sure, we're making petitions to the Lord. And that's what we're called to do. Jesus then enters into the familiar text that provides the foundation for what we call the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Praise God. It starts with this thought. There's a throne and I am not on it. The Lord is on the throne. Praise be to God. 
Notice also that Jesus is teaching those gathered, the disciples and others, on how to pray. And he tells them to start with this, our Father who is in heaven. Jesus is doing the teaching, but he's telling them not to pray to him, but to pray to the Father. Again, if this is his initial, initial teaching, how would it come off if his initial teaching was, when you pray, pray to me? It's not the message. When you pray, pray to the Father. Now, there are many, quite unfortunately, in our society today, for whom the notion of father is not a positive one. Either because their relationship with their own father is either non-existent or a very, very negative influence on their house, on, on their life. And so that needs to be respected. The discomfort that some have in our society with God as father. We need to find a middle ground for those people who, for, who, for whom the notion of father, that, that the image of father is a negative one. We need to embrace them and show them empathy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're seeking God's rule and God's judgment to the earth. It's a real statement of humility in submission to the Lord. Give us this day our daily bread. Notice, please, the very modest request. Give us this day our daily bread. It doesn't say give us this day a beach house and a shiny new car and sufficient millions to live off for the rest of my life. It's a prayer for daily bread. And when you pray only for daily bread, the assumption is you're gonna to pray tomorrow again for daily bread. So again, it's a prayer of humility and submission. I'll be quite honest and say, I'm, I've never been worried about where today's or tomorrow's food is going to come from. That hasn't been a factor in my life. I suspect the same is true for many or all of you in this room. So when I pray these words, I am humbled and brought to my knees. For I know those for whom daily bread is a fervent prayer. Forgive us our debts as we have, as we have also forgiven our debtors. We've talked at length over the last couple of weeks about God's grace and God's forgiveness, God's eternal and steadfast love for us. This is a prayer that taps into that grace and is a prayer for divine forgiveness and human reconciliation. If we are only going to be forgiven to the extent to which we forgive others, and I suspect we all have some work to do. That's the theme of this portion of the prayer. Now, I grew up in the Methodist church. We say trespasses instead of debtors. The difference is not significant. The point is that we pray for forgiveness as we aspire to forgive others. The text in Matthew then ends with, do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Again, it's a calling for strength. It's tapping into verse 10 that came before, which said, your kingdom come, your will be done. The prayer opens and closes with this same thought. So overall, there are two parts of the prayer. The first part are petitions to God about God's kingdom and the coming of God's kingdom. The second part is about human needs and us making requests and tapping into that. Now, 
The version of the Lord Prayer that we use, that we used earlier, ends with these words. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Right? Sound familiar? Those are the last, the last half of Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, as found in the King James Bible, which was written between like 1706 and 1711. So about the time that Jamestown was being established here in Virginia. The more modern translations of the Bible didn't take King James Version and modernize it, but went back to the original Greek texts, which did not include that phrase, so it's not included in the Bible. We, however, continue to use that phrase in our Lord's Prayer because it's lovely and it's beautiful and it speaks to us. Now, I found myself in preparations glossing over the first portion of the passage to get to the words of the Lord's Prayer because they're so familiar. I love the Lord's Prayer. I love its humility, its calling to be steadfast, its reliance on the Lord. Let us remember verse six. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father in secret. Whether literally alone in my room or in a sanctuary like this or even in a larger crowd, let us all strive to, to achieve the same attitude that is solitary communication with God. Why do we pray? How come? We're striving to be in relationship with God. Relationship with God, like any relationship, requires communication, pure and simple. We're communicating with God. I have friends who open prayer by saying, hey God. It's communication with God and that's all it is. Second reason is I note that Jesus prayed a lot. There's the image of Jesus that Thursday night before he was arrested and before he was crucified on Friday. That Thursday night, he goes into the garden of Gethsemane to pray. And the biblical text says he sweated blood. He was so anxious doesn't begin to describe. He was so concerned, knowledgeable of what was going to happen, and so concerned about what was, what was going to happen, he was dropped to his knees, prayed fervently to the Lord, and was sweating blood. In this Sunday school stories for adults and kids theme later. One of them, I think I said, is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. A, a familiar story. Let me read this. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. So Jesus goes through this amazing experience of feeding 5,000 men plus women plus kids with whatever it was, a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of fish. After that, he sends the disciples away and he goes up on the mountain to pray. Jesus needed to pray a lot. Perhaps we do also. How? Well, I think the Matthew passage covers that pretty well. I have one pastor friend who's a runner. He prays while running. I have another pastor friend who, who prays while driving, presumably eyes open. That's what's important. The words, you know, there are those of us who, who when we pray, it sounds like we're speaking from the King James Bible. That's fine. Not a requirement at all. The idea is that we adopt a prayer lifestyle that deepens our relationship with God. 
Romans chapter 8 says this. One of my favorite passages in, in Paul's letters. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For if we do not know how to pray, the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. If we are in prayer and we don't know what to say, it doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit will intercede on our behalf and communicate on our behalf with God. It's a promise from the Lord. Here's a story that sort of makes that point. It's a story written by, of all people, Leo Tolstoy in 1885, and it's the story of the three hermits. I'll gloss, I'll, I'll abridge it and go through it quickly. But the gist of the story is this great bishop is sailing across the sea, and he's hanging out with the crew and the other people who are sailing on this vessel across the sea, and he hears the crew talking about these three hermits who live a very Spartan lifestyle on an island that is very near the course of where they're going to go. The bishop overhears the discussion and says, I need to meet these guys. They're, they're leading a very humble existence, seeking a closer relationship with God. The bishop says, I need to meet them. And he goes to the captain and says, I need to meet these guys. The captain who'd sailed this passage many times said, those old guys are not worth your time. You don't need to go by and see them. But the bishop exists, uh, insists, and bishops usually get what they want. They get to near the island, and the bishop goes ashore and is greeted on the beach by the three hermits. He asks them, the text says, he asks them how they're seeking their salvation. And what are they doing to serve God? And the hermits say, they, they don't really, they don't know. They don't know how. We simply pray this. Three are you, three are we, have mercy on us. The bishop says, well, that's not, that's improper. You can't just pray in, in that way. I must teach you the proper way to pray. He tells them, I'll preach you, I'll, I'll teach you not my way, but the way in which God through the Holy Scriptures has taught us to pray. And he attempts to preach, to teach these three modest hermits the Lord's Prayer. The lesson goes poorly. The hermit simply can't remember the prayer. And so the bishop extends his stay and teaches late into the evening, drilling them over and over and over again on the Lord's Prayer. Night falls. The three hermits have finally memorized the Lord's Prayer. And the bishop goes back to the boat, content with his teachings of that day. A couple of days pass. The bishop is to the stern of the boat and he sees something following the boat, which he assumes is another vessel. As that vessel grows closer, he realizes it's the three hermits running across the surface of the water toward the boat as if they're running on dry land. The captain stops the ship and waits for the hermits to catch up. They get on the boat and they breathlessly say to the bishop, we've forgotten your prayer. We remembered it for a while, but then when we stopped saying it over and over again, we just forgot. Will you please teach us again? Fortunately, the bishop comes to his senses and says, however you're praying, keep doing that. It is not for me to teach you, the bishop says. Will you please pray for we sinners? And after this, the hermits turned around and presumably ran back across the water 
to their island. I love this story. I love our liturgy. I love the Lord's Prayer and the creeds that we use and these things that are part of our faith tradition. They're important. But it's clear, I think, from the Matthew passage and from the story of the three hermits that God is excited about us having a prayer relationship with him. More so than excited about what kind of exalted prose or poetry we use in that prayer life. As I close this morning, I want to share with you a quote from Mother Teresa. She says this, I used to pray that God would feed the hungry or do this and that, but now I pray that he will guide me in whatever I'm supposed to do. I used to pray for answers. Now I pray for strength. I used to believe that prayer changes things, but now I know that prayer changes us and we change things. That's a really powerful statement and controversial. I used to believe that prayer changes things, but now I know that prayer changes us and we change things. There's a big part of me that loves that sentiment. I don't agree with it 100%, but I love that sentiment. I believe prayer does change things. I think we saw in the video of the, the, the men and women who were in prison who were touched by the Lord and turned their lives around. I think the, the Lord does intervene, that prayer does change things, that the Lord can move mountains. But I also believe that the tremendous value of prayer is the effect, is the effect that such a prayer life has on us. Prayer equips us for daily life, fortifies us in our challenges, enables us to celebrate and give thanks when things are great and to mourn when things are lousy. Wouldn't the world be a better place if all of us spent more time in prayer? Let us seek to be in relationship with the Lord a relationship like all relationships that require regular communications. Lisa's looking at me like, you're such a hypocrite. <laughs> because I'm not a great communicator. I'm just not. But it takes work. Amen? Okay. Let us seek to communicate with God on a daily basis. Let us reap the rewards that such a life of consistent prayer can have in our life. Amen.